Okay, good morning. Uh, let's begin our study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence once again as we open up your word. As we look at the past and see how it uh, addresses the present, we know that there are many things that we still don't fully understand. And so we need your guidance and direction, your instruction. Help us to trust your word and to be obedient to all the things that you have given us and forgive us for our sins and for our lack of faith and trust in you and our indolence and our failure in the past uh, to study your word. We ask, Lord, that we can redeem the time as we have awakened out of our sleep. Be with us now. Be with each person watching these videos. May you work powerfully in their lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again, everyone. Now, yesterday we, um, we went through a, a review of the lines. And so what's one of the things that we have learned over the last year or so regarding uh, how to understand the way marks and the reform lines. What's what's the thing that we brought out yesterday? How do we look at a reform line? What what does a what is a way mark in a reform line? Let's ask the question that way. So we don't have Dwight here yet this morning, so he usually answers my questions, but. Somebody else can answer that. Usually something significant that happens. Okay, so we have a so we have a way mark. So it's it's uh, an event on a line, and and remember we have in um, Isaiah twenty eight, <clears throat> we have um, a line and a plummet, right? So a plummet is um, a righteousness and a line is judgment. So it's, it's a way mark, it's a test, it's a separation of classes. So that means each way mark has a reform line attached to it. <clears throat> that is, we have a reform line, but when we look at a way mark and we zoom into it, <clears throat> we're going to see another reform line. And Part of the problem that we have faced in this movement is we haven't fully understood how reform lines work. We haven't understood this part of it. And we had a false way of understanding reform lines, <clears throat> which was Parminder's way of understanding reform lines. And he rejected a principle that Jeff had been teaching for years. And, and that was the principle that every way mark typifies every other way mark and if that's the case then we can see how these lines line up that is we have a reform line and we have a way mark and that way mark is a reform line but it's also going to be tied to the next way mark because part of that reform line of that way mark contains a way mark that is the next way mark and now Jeff never fully understood this, that he never fully understood how these lines connected or how these way marks connected. Now Parminder did these staggered way marks where we just started moving the time of the end over uh, for each group of people. And, and Jeff had kind of started it, but Parminder sort of elaborated upon it. And he used um, different types of of uh, ways of interpreting a line, such as you could use uh, a line as represented by the harvest. That's one of the main ones he used. But you could, of course, use a building. Um, and I can't remember, I always forget the list of the ways that we can look at a reform line. But he, he started to use these harvest. Uh, yeah, we have the building of the sanctuary, you have the, the sanctuary becomes a reform line way of doing things. Well, I can't remember the other ones. Harvest, building, 
I don't know, for some reason my mind always goes blank. But part of the problem that he had when he did this harvest um, reform line is it, it created some inconsistencies, which he tried to resolve. And I don't know if people remember how he was doing the reform lines in 2018, but this was sort of, he had introduced some new ideas. And these ideas have still predominantly um, been affecting this movement. So when we're looking at, um, I don't know why I have it in Joshua, Judges chapter four, Deborah and Barak, and we've we're started to look at this line and we're gonna have to deal with it in more detail. We can see that this is a enemy, an enemy that in a sense has been here since 2001, at least that's the way that it's been addressed. That is 2001 is uh, a way mark that introduces two different things. It can, well, it can be the arrival of the second angel's message, or it can be the empowerment of the first angel's message. But we're looking at judges as representing the history of this movement since 9-11. And when we um, look at this error that Parminder brought in, we're going to say that it's in 2012 or 2014, depending how you look at it. Um, he definitely comes in 2012 with time setting, so that's probably the best place to look at it. But Parminder's been in this movement even before 9-11. But he starts introducing these ideas. And now Jeff in 2012 <coughs> defeats Parminder. That is, Parminder introduces this time setting. And they're going to have on uh, April 28th, um, 2012, they're going to have a, uh, a presentation by Jeff, which I haven't been able to find yet. I don't know if I will be able to find it. It might not exist. They might not have put it up. It might have been taken down at some point. I don't know. Um, but we don't have a copy of it. At least I don't. Um, and But in that presentation, they, he exposed Parminder's um, study. And, and the only thing I could think is it was around the time of Habakkuk's two tables, and I wonder if maybe if it's in there somewhere. Never thought of that just till now. But, um, but he's going to expose that Parminder, what's happening in Wales is how he addresses it. It's, it's the, this fanaticism in Wales, um, that it's, it's, it's an error. And, and he's going to introduce a document, um, and maybe we could find that document, but that is the document that he later released back in 2018 and then released again uh, when Parminder had, uh, had the rebellion at Baal Peor in uh, the end of August in uh, 2019. So, so Jeff, Jeff addressed this whole issue of time setting and the way that Parminder had been in error in regard to his time setting. Now, the problem with Parminder's time setting is it was what I would call real time setting, and it was done by rejecting statements in the spirit of prophecy. And this was based upon basically a papal way of studying um, as we talked about yesterday, it's, it's, it's a deception that is to enter into a dialectic, to enter into uh, uh, an argument with someone on their ground is a danger because you're entering on the enemy's ground. You're entering into a debate based upon principles or a battlefield that has been chosen by the enemy. And this has been a common problem. Uh, throughout history. I mean, this is one of the reasons that the Jews uh, ended up uh, falling away from God at the time of Christ is all around them was Greek thought. And they tried to battle Greek thought with a sort of modified Jewish philosophy. And it ended up drawing them into all kinds of intellectual traps. 
Um, so it's kind of a natural thing. We want to appear, Adventism has done this all the time. We don't want to be considered a cult. So in the 1850s, when we meet with the evangelicals, we're entering on their ground. And in doing so, we lead Adventism astray. Now, of course, it had been going on for a long time before the 1850s. Um, we can see this with W.W. Um, w. Prescott. Um, he wanted to be accepted by the evangelicals, by the Protestants, and believe that by um, adapting his teachings to this sort of scholarly way of looking at things, he would receive Adventism, would get this sort of uh, respect that it would need in order to present the gospel to Protestants. And we see the same type of thing in our movement has, has happened. Jeff never get, got caught up in it, but many of the people who were in the movement believe that they could somehow convince the conference that the 2520 was correct, for instance. And, and we saw people in our movement fall away. Um, we can see this with Emiliano in his, uh, back in 2000, and it must have been 2012, when he went to a conference in Germany and he got to present. You know, we somehow think that if we get the approval of the church or of the world, that we can somehow win them. But how do we win people to Christ? It definitely can't be by becoming like them. We have to be calling people out of Babylon, which means we have to have a pure faith, and we can't enter onto their territory, onto that um, enchanted ground, which I believe that uh, the scholarly intellectual world, that system of study is enchanted ground. And that's what Parminder was doing. He was doing it in a way that was very, very subtle. Um, but as he progressed, you could see it more and more. So, <clears throat> so we have Parminder as part of this, this general, he's Sisera, that is, he's not a papist openly, but he is intellectually, which Jabin the king of Canaan represents, I believe, the papacy. And so we have Parminder um, introducing to this movement this system of intellectual philosophy. And many people get deceived by it. They get caught up in it. And so the vast majority of this movement ends up following Parminder. But we're still not free from this enemy. That is, Parminder's thoughts and ideas, which had resonated with many of us with our thinking, even if we ultimately rejected Parminder as a person, doesn't mean that we rejected his, his ideas. So, I mean, part of what we have to look at is really, in, in doing this study, is really understand what it is. Because we can talk about it in this general sense, you know, a system of intellectual philosophy. We can talk about it as papal thought. We can say it's the Protestant method of Bible study. And all these things are true, but we really need to define what those things are. Or really, we need to look at what the truth is and see those things in contrast to the true method of study. Now, one of the things we brought up was Parminder's study on the 2520. And I'd asked, you know, how many people had seen it. Um, and, and I know Angela had seen it, but it was a long time ago. Now, what he basically does is he enters onto that territory of that battlefront, which had been this wall that had been ra raised up um, by people like Ty Gibson, um, James Rafferty. Um, there's a whole bunch of guys. I can't think of everybody's names. Um, uh, Steve Wahlberg, uh, Eugene Pruitt, um, the guy from greatcontroversy.org. Um, can't think of his name. But there's a number of these pastors and scholars 
conservatives, right, who, who really opposed the 2520. And they did so upon supposed linguistic grounds. And they took the article which has been falsely attributed to James White, the January 24th, 1864 uh, Review and Herald article, uh, which was written by Uriah Smith, uh, where he uses Jesenius's lexicon and tries to argue that um, the, and we're, we're going to look at this here. So um, maybe what I should do, I'm going to go to a paper that I wrote here. So and maybe not everybody's completely familiar with um, this whole argument. So, you know, especially people watching this, not everybody may have been through that history. Now, I've written a paper why there's not a period, a 25, 20 year period of continual punishment uh, for literal Israel found in Leviticus 26. Now, this was um, really quite a divergence from the arguments. Like, I have this uh, PDF. It's kind of interesting. It's uh, 1872 kilobytes, but. Uh, uh, it's the size of the, the document. <clears throat> so I'll switch the screens. So it's quite a, a bombastic title there. But the idea was it's countering the argument. And, and in some ways, um, what I'm trying to do is to, instead of entering into that argument, the ground that they're making, though I do address it, um, I really try to look at the problem from a different angle, and I've had lots of ways in which I've done that. This this paper wasn't really successful uh, in the sense of of convincing anyone that I know of, but um, I do go through Leviticus 26 and I address uh, the argument uh, dealing with. And let's see if I can find it here. So. So I deal with this intensity or duration. So people can find this on my uh, academia site. Um, and Iran, do you, you just have the link to my academia site on uh, palmoni.org, but you don't have any of the actual papers. But you can go there if you want to find the link. Yeah, it's under documents. Yeah, under documents, yeah. Um, so I just I address this here. The word that is translated as seven times is the Hebrew word Sheba. The understanding of the meaning of this word and how it is applied in Leviticus 26 is crucial to the argument around whether or not we can find a 25, 20 year period in Leviticus 26. Um, so I'm going to go through it and address this argument. And at the time I wrote this, which was 2015, I was still under the impression that James Wright had written this review and Herald ar article. Um, but I later found that that wasn't the case. And, and the reason why people think he wrote it is because when you go to the um, E.G. White disc or even to the uh, website, um, they're just, they, they, it's not, the author's name isn't given. But since James White is the editor, it is assumed that he wrote it. But actually at the time in 1864, James White was not the editor. Uh, Uriah Smith was, but they hadn't changed it on the masthead. And and the reason is, is James White was traveling with Ellen White after the death of their son, um, uh, Henry. So it, late in, uh, well, that was in, I think, December 8th, 1863. So, so James White wasn't actively involved in what was happening at the review. And, and this is an article which shows the style and the types of arguments that you would see from Uriah Smith. You will never see James White quoting Jesenius, but you will regularly see Uriah Smith quoting Jesenius. Now, if James White did write the article, he would have just been using arguments that were given by Uriah Smith. But it doesn't appear to be the style of writing of James White. But anyway, I do address this. But 
that's not really my main argument in this paper. And later on, because we come to understand the four seven times, uh, the main argument that we have to come to is that the reason uh, the um, the twenty five twenty comes from Leviticus twenty six is sort of a more indirect way. That is, literal Israel fulfills. Uh, that prophecy in Leviticus 26 in periods of 70 years and 140 years over a 220 year period. Now, I found other ways in which to present this to the people, but part of what I had to remove in my thinking is I had to get away from trying to combat people on their ground and move over to just looking at things from the way that they're presented in the Bible. And, and that thinking in myself has taken time. Um, because what we do is we make enemies. When we, when we try to de defeat people in an argument, we try to destroy their argument. The only way that we can do that, generally speaking, in, in, the, in the way that they might even consider that they've been destroyed, is by beating them in, in a battle. But if you beat someone in a battle, do you, do you, is he a friend now or an enemy? He's, he's going to be your enemy. You're not going to win him. And that's not the way of Christ. That is, we should seek to win people to Christ, not just defeat them. And this was a problem in 1888. Adventist pastors were excellent at debates. They could trounce their opponent, but they didn't win anyone. And, and so this is a danger that's happened. But I, and I'm no different than Parminder in this sense. When I first came into this movement and I started looking at the 2520, it was basically how do I understand these arguments and how do I convince people that they're wrong. And of course, none of those people that I discussed with, Ty Gibson, um, other, other people who were opposed, Eugene Pruitt, different people I had exchanges with, was ever convinced. Pastors, you know, anyone. Uh, so so this, this paper, though, introduces this idea that Leviticus 26 is fulfilled with literal Israel, which was a completely new idea, um, though hinted at partly in Miller's studies, but never really fully understood in this movement. So um, just flipping through this paper here, you can see all these different charts and stuff, how they look, they're like my old style of way I did things. Um, but there was a number of different things that were done that, that God revealed as we continued to study um, the 2520 and, and other things in this movement that have corrected us. And so we continually need to learn from that. Um, so let's go back here. Now we've, we've, so what, if we're going to describe the way that we have been studying, how is this different from the Protestant method of study? So how would a Protestant, if he's going to read Judges chapter four or Judges at all, uh, for instance, if you go to Judges chapter two and we looked at Judges chapter two and we could see the Judges chapter two, verse one, uh, represented this uh, the angel coming down from Gilgal to Bochum to the weepers. Do you think a Protestant would take this passage and understand that this is 2001? That this is Revelation chapter 18, verse 1? Could a Protestant possibly do that?
Perhaps if you have the rare one who is really seeking light. Okay. Now you say perhaps, and, and that's that's actually a good response because there are people who might see something in the scriptures that doesn't lie on the surface. Now it could be that God's speaking to them individually, so that they may see some verse in a sense out of context. And they may apply it to their lives. Now, one of the things when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist and I started reading Adventist literature like uh, the SDA Bible commentary, things like that, um, is I found that they, they had set up a system of Bible study that was based upon first understanding the context of a statement its historical application and that um, we couldn't put any hidden meaning into a text and they would usually refer to a Jewish idea of thinking and they would call this idea of, of Jewish interpretation um, basically they would say it came from Greek thought so on the surface what they were saying seemed to make sense that is the Jews believed that there was different levels of Bible study. There was the story itself, which would be historical. Then there would be uh, a deeper, more allegorical way of looking at things. And you would have to say that our movement in some ways sees things allegorically. That is, typically in symbols, that all these things were written as types. So we understand that when we read the Old Testament, there is the actual story, but these stories are types. Now, Protestants, the scholarly Protestant world, has moved away from that. That is, they will just look at the story as what happened historically, and that any application that's made sort of in a typical sense has to be explicit within the, the text itself. So, for instance, when Moses talks um, about one that's going to come. We're going to take that as Christ because the New Testament interprets it as Christ. But there is this, still this tendency within Adventism to reject almost anything allegorical. That if we read into the scripture that Joseph is a type of Christ, that that is just man's thinking and so adventism has tried to adopt a way of studying that is um i would say unspiritual that is it's not it's just understanding what's being said and nothing more and this is the protestant way of of dealing with it now of course there's lots of different types of protestants and lots of different people who interpret the bible different ways but I mean, you would, if you were in an evangelistic series back in um, the 1980s, one of the things they would always talk is about how to study the Bible and that you can't just take two different verses, that a verse without a context is a pretext is one of the things people would say. But the question is, how do we understand um, the scriptures? Like, how do we understand what a context is? Because what is the context of Scripture? What is the ultimate context in which we study the Bible? I don't know if that's a good way to ask the question. Because what is the Bible telling us about? Oh, with me, it's to, to know God more. And I realize in my finite mind, I will never know him completely, but at least to know his will for the day, day by day, right? And for the rest of my life. Okay. So, so it's to get to know God, right? It's revealing God's character. Now, we know that the first um, revelation of God's character is nature. Nature is uh, the first book. And, and in nature, it speaks of God allegorically, right? If, I, if I'm working in my garden 
and I'm pulling weeds and I'm thinking about the words of Christ about the garden, you know, the you know the the seed that's ca cast among tares and or the tares in the garden or whatever these different sort of parables these are allegories and i'm experiencing god speaking to me through the things that he has created and i can see the working of sin that has come into this world and i can see what's necessary for salvation i can see that if i want to uh, plant seed that i don't just go to the door of my house and throw a handful of seeds out into the yard and expect to get a harvest. My brother David tried that. It, it didn't really work. Um, he was a hippie. So um, if you're going to get a harvest, you need to prepare the soil. You need to, to plant the seeds. You need to water. You need the sun. You need God. You need the rain. You need to weed that garden. And then there's going to come a time that uh, you tend to those plants and then you can harvest that crop and and these are things that teach us about how god works in our lives and also about how we need to work in ministering to others so all of these things are allegories so if we were to take away the allegorical nature of scripture if we were just to take these stories as stories of things that happened and might have a moral to the story like a lesson uh that you get at the end of the story so you know you take the story of abraham and you could say well you know what you should do is not have more than one wife or something like that you know as an allegory or we could learn these moral lessons from these stories but that's not really what we, we're doing in this movement we're not just looking at the bible as a bunch of stories that teach us moral lessons we see them as types so we take the story of joseph and we we can look at significance of the fact that he's 30 years old when he stands before pharaoh and that's going to begin a period of seven years and christ when he's 30 is going to begin a period of seven years his seven years is going to be three and a half on earth and three and a half in heaven before jewish probation closes and then's going to begin the famine that famine's going to end for a period of seven times 252 years, and it's going to end in 1798, right? So we can take these things and, and do this, but this is not the Protestant way of Bible study. It's not the scholarly way. This, they would look at this in the way that our scholars look at even just the idea of taking uh, scriptures and like Paul does in Hebrews chapter 1, where he uses all these different scriptures as proof texts to show that Jesus is God, our scholars would look at that and say, uh, well, Paul can do it, but that's not how we study the Bible because he's taken those statements out of context and only a prophet can do that. For us, we have to understand those statements in context. But we know that that's not the case. We know that the context is the plan of salvation. It's the great controversy that each of these stories is illustrating a reform line and that, that those reform lines are types and that we can line up these reform lines and they're going to keep adding detail. Now, Parminder, when he was uh, presenting his method of study, he wasn't really doing that. He was doing a thing called parable teaching. Now, parable teaching is allegorical. But does anybody really know what was wrong with what Parminder was doing in regard to parable teaching? What, what the error was? Because, I mean, Christ taught with parables. Does anybody know? I mean, maybe you're not familiar enough with it. But just in general, if I create a parable, does that mean that my parable reflects truth? A 
Okay, Iran says his parables had no foundation. Yeah, and that's correct. That is, I grew up with parable teaching. So Parminder was really teaching me and teaching this movement what I grew up with. And not just in the area of parable teaching, but also in the type of dispensationalism that he used. So one is, we know that anything we believe can never contradict a plain statement or teaching in scripture. So when you have this dispensationalism that was connected with his parable teaching, he could say that Ellen White understood um, everything in the context of a, uh, a Christian of the 19th century. And so her understanding and the things that she taught aren't necessarily correct because we're more advanced now and we understand things more than she did. And so she would have just believed a lot of things that people in her day believed. And that we can also say she was a prophet for her time, but she was in a different dispensation. And so the things that she's saying don't really apply to us. Now, of course, that's a rejection of a basic principle that all new light is just an unfolding of established truth, that the old light is never done away when you have new light, in fact, the old light shines brighter. But Parminder in his dispensationalism would reject statements of the past. And, and I grew up with that. So something in the Old Testament, well, that was a different dispensation. So Christ is giving you a new teaching. And so Parminder was using that. But when it came to the parable teaching, the idea was that you could create a parable, but that parable would then just be a story that you could tell. That is, he would believe that if you made this narrative, this story, that you could illustrate it with a parable, it was true. That's what my dad taught, and that's what Parminder taught. But there would be no foundation, as Aran says, to that. That is, a parable can illustrate something that is true but just because you make a parable, does it mean that your parable is true? That is, it can illustrate. You have a truth and you can illustrate it with a parable, but you can't create truth by creating a parable. And so they believed it's just the story that you create um, and that you could create different stories and you could create your own parables. This is what they were suggesting, is that we need to create our own parables. And, and this is not what we are taught in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy about parables. Parables reflect truths that already exist. It's a way of teaching. It's parable teaching. It's not parables creating truth. So I'm not sure if I'm really helping everyone at the, right now understand this this problem of, of Parminder because because of its subtle nature so he appears to be accepting line upon line but he forces the lines to fit his narrative or his story and he at least started doing this back um, in 2016 at least um, and he would do this with things like steps to Christ. He would take the steps of salvation, put them on the reform line and say, well, baptism is 9-11. And since baptism is 9-11, that means after 9-11, this movement does not commit sin. It makes no mistakes. It's perfect. And he was setting us up. Right. So that he could then be the leader of this movement that has made no mistakes. But Jeff is going to be the leader of the first movement prior to 9-11, and he's going to have faults. And so Parminder could set himself up as the one that now is the leader of the movement. He's Elisha. Jeff was just Elijah. Um, yeah, so... Um, okay, so Angela put here in the chat, in Judges 2-1, we have an angel coming up. In Revelation 18, 1, and an angel coming down. 
so may people may quibble over this, but it appears to be a literal angel in Judges 2 and a figurative in Revelation 18. Yes. Um, now, in Hebrew, is there any difference between coming and going? There isn't, right? They don't have that distinction. Uh, we have to make that distinction in, in English, but it doesn't exist in Hebrew. Um, and, and I can show you this here. Um, uh, so this angel came up from Gilgal. So this word came up uh, means to ascend, uh, be high or active, used in a great variety of senses. Send up once, break, bring, cause, carry, climb, show, depart, exalt, excel, fall, fetch, get up, go away, grow, increase, lay, leap, levy, lift. Uh, it means lots of different things. Shoot forth, um, all these types of things. Um, and from Gilgal to Bochum, right? And if you look at, now, of course, Revelation is written in Greek, but there is really no difference in, in understanding these things. A, a mighty angel came down. We could say, well, this is the word descend. But the idea in Hebrew is that you can, whether you're coming or you're going, whether you're ascending or descending, it's still really the same idea. It's moving from one place to another. And so the context decides whether you're coming down or whether you're going up. So if we go back here then to um, Judges, and we look at this, an angel Lord came up from Gilgal. You could easily say came from Gilgal to Bochum right? It's just that the idea here is that this angel is coming from one place to another. And um, there's other places I could show this as well. But here is even this word that I have brought you into the land which I swear. Um, it means go or come in Hebrew. And you can see going or coming in English are two different things, but in Hebrew, they're one thing. So um, now, so there is a point there. So um, with this idea, what um, Angela is suggesting is definitely people can uh, look at, like, people are always going to find a way to argue against something. But we, here we have a literal angel in Judges 2, which of course is figurative in Revelation 18. But we have an angel coming down from heaven to this earth. And of course, if it's coming down from heaven, it's, it's coming from heaven to earth. Now, why would... Um, if you're going from Gilgal to Bochum, if you're going from Gilgal, that's by uh, the River Jordan, and Bochum is which which place did we say this was? Bochum represents what city? You remember? Anyone? Because it's not Bethel. Bethel, right? So Bethel, Bethel. So. I mean, technically, you would have to go up from the river to go to a place that's higher. So in elevation, you would be going up. So, so I mean, just physically, it would be up, which is why you would probably have this word a lot, which means to ascend, because you're going to have to go from something lower to something higher. But the idea here is this is the angel of the Lord coming from Gilgal. And what is Gilgal then as a symbol?
a way mark or a turning point, right? It's a wheel. And is 9 11 a, a way mark or a turning point? You'd have to say yes. So, so this has to be representing 9 11 as a symbol. The other way that we could look at this is simply that um, when you have something illustrating something else, it can sometimes occur as a mirror. So if somebody wanted to argue, well, this is coming up in Revelation 18, it's coming down, you could say, well, that's just a mirror. But I, I think it's much deeper than that. That is, we can't, we have to look at the whole story. So there is a truth about context. Just hang on a second here. It says my battery's running low. Well, that's why it's not plugged in. Okay. <clears throat> um, there is a truth about understanding context. Now, what is the context then that we're going to look at a story in the Bible in? As we talked about earlier, but it, it has to do with the great controversy. But how do we define that context? Every story in the Bible is what? What can we do with every story in the Bible? I try to see whether it whether it has any impact on my life, whether there are there are parallels. But okay. I take them very personally. Okay, so parallels. Now we know that a story then is a reform line, because everything in the Bible is representing the gospel, and the gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and um, uh, demonstrates two classes of worshipers. So when we look at Judges chapter 2, and we say that this is our reform line, would we say that this is the second angel's message? So we're not going to look at Judges chapter 2 verse 1 as the time of the end, right? So in, if, in the book of Judges, where is the time of the end? So if I go to Judges chapter 1, do I find a time of the end in Judges chapter 1? That begins this reform line. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Okay, let me see. Not, nothing in the chat. Now, could we take the death of Joshua as a time of the end? Or is there some other way, Mark, that we would look at as the time of the end? Do we have any symbols that we can take from Judges chapter 1 that marks the time of the end, besides the death of Joshua? Perhaps verse 9. Okay, so afterward the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain in the south and in the valley. Okay. So what about the 70 uh, kings that are mentioned? Three score and 10 kings. Can that represent a time of the end?
Is the 70 years captivity the end of it marking a time of the end? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is, is the 70 years parallel to the 1260 that marks the time of the end? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So we can see here in chapter one, the chapter one can represent the time of the end and the first angel's message that that's going to then result in the second angel's message arriving in Judges chapter two. But also a person could look at this and see also a reform line in and of itself, right? Because we know when we zoom into a way mark, we always have a reform line. And so we could see a reform line within Judges 1 itself. Now, Judges chapter 2 is introducing, I believe, for us, this second angel's message, Revelation 18, that it's representing this movement. And this movement primarily right now is a zoom into 9-11. The reform line that we're zooming into in 9-11 is part of a bigger reform line that includes 9-11, but it's actually a zoom into the Sunday law. That is, what we call the line of the Levites is a zoom into the Sunday law itself. Because on the big line, which we looked at yesterday, Ellen White sees the Sunday law next, Revelation 18. But we know that we experienced Revelation 18 at 9-11. But that experience of Revelation 18 at 9-11 is part of that Sunday law. But also this movement itself is a zoom into that waymark that we might call the repeat of Millerite history. That is, Millerite history is repeating. And this movement has experienced 9-11. But that's one way mark and our reform line, or at least a reform line, which we're a part of, is a zoom into 9-11. And that we're not, we're not where we thought we were in the bigger line, that is the Sunday law is still coming and it could be coming very quickly. Reform lines can come fairly fast. They don't, there's not a, a time limit of how long a reform line takes. Do you have a comment there, Angela, or a thought? No, but I just looked at uh, Judges 1, not, well, it is a comment. And when I noticed that it says dwelt in the mountain and in the south and in the valley, I was going to ask whether we had, when we went over Judges 1, whether we had compared Judges 1, 9 with Daniel. I think it's Daniel 8, 9, where it talks about the pleasant land and the south and so forth. I think we did, didn't we? Yeah. Okay. We touched on that a little bit. I can't remember all the things we said about it. Um, but definitely this becomes a type of the Sunday law, right? So that is in Judges chapter one, it's going to illustrate a reform line because it's the first way mark. It's the time of the end. And we know that in the time of the end, you know, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come, is a reform line. The first angel's message contains all of the messages. And this is a basic thing that that um, Jeff taught, and it's a thing that Parminder attacked. And, and I was very surprised when Parminder said that waymarks don't typify each other, that Jeff actually accepted it. And he was presenting and he was illustrating how some Waymark was typifying another waymark, and then he said, oh, I can't do that, you know, because Parminder says that's wrong, and so he had to change what he was doing, and I was like, this doesn't make sense. Parminder was wrong about that, because if, if waymarks don't typify each other, then our whole message is in error, because that's what it was founded upon. So... So when we start to understand these lines, because that's what this series is on, is understanding the lines. And we're going back to this story in Judges, chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, 
at this point, we're going to obviously go far farther in this story. We can see that there is these reform lines, but they're that they're quite intricate, and um, they're interlocked with each other. That is, there are things in Judges chapter one that illustrate things that happen later. History is repeated, and remember, in Judges chapter one, we dealt a lot with. The children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, so that's um, Moses, um, uh, where was this? Uh, went out of the city of the palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness. So this is going to be, um, what's his name here? Uh, Othiel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it and gave to Aksa, his daughter, to wife came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father's father a field and she lighted off from her ass and Caleb said unto her what wilt thou and she said unto him give me a blessing for thou hast given me a south land give me also springs of water and Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs and the children of the Kenite Moses father-in-law went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah which lieth to the south of Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. And Judah went with Simeon his brother, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath, and utterly destroyed it, etc. Now, when we studied this, uh, the city of the palm trees, so this had to do with the seven times. So we could see that this Judges chapter 1 itself is illustrating this movement. But we could also say it's the arrival of the first angel's message. And, and when it came to Moses' father-in-law here, uh, what did we find that this was referring to? If you remember. There was there was a uh, something that we had found regarding this. I don't know if anybody remembers. Because this is talking about uh, Hobab, and is Hobab Moses' father-in-law? <coughs> He's a brother-in-law. Is the brother-in-law right and it's just that this word translated father-in-law can have different meanings and we find this from the spirit of prophecy that it's actually hobab so the children of the kenite moses father-in-law that's moses brother-in-law hobab went up out of the city of the palm trees with the jude with judah with the children of judah into the wilderness of judah which lieth in the south of arad and they went and dwelt among the people so, so there's still things that we, we don't fully understand yet that we haven't brought together from Judges chapter one, um, because this is going to be illustrating this history and we're gonna run into the same things in Judges chapter four, right? Because we're gonna deal with Heber who is a Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses in Judges 4.11, but we know that it's actually the brother-in-law of Moses, not the father-in-law. And, and the, he had severed himself from the Kenites, that is Heber had, and pitched his tent unto the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kedesh. So in order for us to understand this story, we have to put it on a line. And we have to recognize what the messages are that are being present, represented and how they tie to the past. So, so what we're going to say is Judges 1 is the first angel's message, but it's representing or giving us illustrations or laying a foundation for Judges chapter 2. That is... The first angel's message is the foundation. Is that what this movement has taught?
Why, why do we say the first angel's message is the foundation? Or am I incorrect in saying that? That the foundation is laid in the first angel's message. Anyone? Why would why would we put the first angel's message as the foundation? Okay, let's take a look um, at that. because it calls us to repent and fear God and give glory to Him. So that's coming to Christ and living your life for, for Him right there. Okay, so so we know that in order to have the first angel's message, in order to have the second angel's message, you have to have the first. Fear God. That's the first angel's message. Give glory to him. That's the second angel's message. And the third angel's message is judgment. So you can't have a second without the first, as Iran says. Now, if we look at the seven kings, uh, which I have up here, and this is just the names of the last seven kings of Judah. And we can see that um, Josiah represents the foundation, right? Manasseh is the first angel's message arriving. Ammon is uh, the formalization of the message. And Josiah is, um, represents the empowerment of the message. Jehoah has is the arrival of the second angel's message. Jehoiakim is the formalization. Jehoiachin is the empowerment. And Zedekiah is the arrival of the third. This is how we understood the seven kings of Judah. This is how Jeff understood it back in 2013. Right? And he did the same type of thing with um, the, first king, the last kings of Israel. And, and you can see I have underneath here, I have these messages. Now, this I did a long time ago. This is the way that we understood it is the second angel arrived in May of 1842. We now know that that's uh, not when it arrived. It arrives on April 19th. Because back here, I didn't have midnight and the midnight cry. So I didn't fully understand it. Jeff didn't fully understand it back then. Now, um, let's see if I can find, okay, so we have literal foundations being laid. This is, I'm just going, searching the word foundation here, so it's going to take me a little bit to find what I want. Okay, so here's what I want. So this is uh, the history of the beginning of the 2300 days and the history of the end of the 2300 days. That is, this is the reform line that begins the 2300 days, and this is the reform line that ends it. So this has this time at the end, that 70 years that we talked about, that are going to end. There's actually two periods of 70 years that end two years apart. So you have um, the fall of Babylon, which is the end of the 70 years for Babylon, and then you have Osiris's decree, which is marking um, uh, the end of the captivity in Babylon. And you can see, so we have uh, the way that I wrote it here, whether this is the correct way or not, I don't know. But under Cyrus, with the defeat of um, Babylon, you're going to have the arrival of the first, you're going to have a formalization that occurs, and then an empowerment. And however we want to look at that uh, formalization I put when Cyrus comes to the throne, the death of Darius, and then the empowerment when he issues the decree in 536. And then the second angel arrives in 520, and that's with um, uh, the messages that are going to come through Haggai and Zechariah that are going to lead to the commencement of the building of the temple. So here the, the foundation is this temple's foundation. And then we're going to have this work of the enemies. These are the people that are going to be opposing this. Now, this is, of course, happening in connection further back. 
but more specifically with false Smyrtus, who puts an end to the building of the temple, and, and then the enemies that continually try to stop them. And then you're going to have Darius's decree, which would be a formalization of that message, and then it's empowered when the temple is dedicated in 515 on March 12th. And, um, and then you're going to have this tearing time. This is this period of time in which uh, before Artaxerxes' decree, Artaxerxes' decree, the 70 weeks are going to begin. You have the number of seven attached here. And then you also have a disappointment, which is going to be dealing with, of course, Nehemiah's history as well. And then you're going to have the streets and walls built. This is the fourth angel's message in that history. Um, and we can see we have the same thing in Millerite history. With the period of darkness, the captivity, you're going to have the arrival of the first angel's message. You have the laying of the foundation, the work of the enemies. Again, I still have a second angel arriving here in May of 1842, but we would just move that to April. And then we're going to have uh, this revival. And then there's a tarrying time. And then the third angel's message arrives October 22nd, 1844. There's a disappointment. And then you're going to have this fourth angel arriving in that history um, with the rebuilding of Jericho and the establishment of the Adventist church. So this is one way to look at it. Um, but we can see here that we have these reform lines. And these reform lines have a foundation, and that foundation is under the first angel's message. So now what does a foundation imply? I know that's a really bad question. But if you're building a foundation, what are you doing? What, why, why do you build a foundation? So, so why would you build a foundation? I mean, out, outside here, you lay a foot in the forest, huh? you're going to build something on it, supports a structure, right? Now, yeah. We do have right next to an apartment, a foundation that was built in the 1980s with nothing on it. Uh, but I don't think that that was the intent just to build a foundation. It's just sitting there rotting away. Um, the idea of a foundation is you're going to build something upon it. But the foundation gives you, to some degree, the structure of what you're going to build upon it. So when you build a foundation, you know how big that building is going to be. Maybe not how high it's going to be, though you could probably ascertain that based on the type of foundation you build. But the foundation contains the information and the support for building something upon it. So how big it's going to be, how long it's going to be, how wide it's going to be. And, and is it going to be able to support what's going to be built upon it? So, so you have the structure, the shape of the building, and then, of course, it's going to be built upon that. So when we look at uh, the idea of the three angels' messages, that the first angel's message contains the information of the second and the third. But the, and this, that means the second and the third are dependent upon the first angel arriving and the laying of that foundation. So simply, we're, we're, when we say that Judges chapter 1 is that foundation, it's the, it's the message dealing with... Uh, Joshua and also the death of Joshua. So it's going to deal with some stuff before the death of Joshua and some stuff after the death of Joshua. But it's the foundation then that's been laid. Now, not all of the enemies are, are going to eventually be destroyed. But we're going to have in Judges chapter 1, we have the death of Joshua being introduced, but we're going to deal with information that occurs before his death. And then we have Judges chapter 2. This has to be the arrival of the second angel's message. But it's going to illustrate all of the things that are then going to follow. 
right? It's going to mention the death of Joshua again. And it's also going to mention that there's these judges that are going to come. And these judges come because God is going to prove his people because they, um, so what's the word? Where is the, I'm trying to find the verse. Yeah, it's verse 22. So Judges 2.22, uh, that through them, these nations that weren't conquered, I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as the fathers did keep it or not. So Judges chapter 2 is representing the second angel's message. But we say that it represents a period from 9-11 to 2023. Now, is this movement presently in the second angel's message? That is, are we after 9-11? And, and we would have to say yes. And, and what is th then what is the message that this movement is to be proclaiming? Is it to be proclaiming the, the third angel's message? It's a trick question. Anybody want to try to answer a trick question? When did the third angel's message arrive? So somebody made a comment in the chat. That wasn't on this question though. 1844. So we are under the proclamation of the third angel's message. So definitely this is the proclamation of the third angel's message. In the repeat of history, however, we are, um, we know that the second angel arrives to empower the third angel. Right, it joins with the third angel. But in order for this message to do its work, it has to first do the work of the second angel. Now, we know that according to Ellen White, when does the, the second angel arrive, or the other angel she, of Revelation 18, which is the second angel, when does it arrive to join the third angel? Does she put it at 9-11? 9-11 was the Okay, so Ellen White doesn't put it at 9-11. She puts it at the Sunday Law. Correct? Because she has the, the correct, William? She puts it at the Sunday Law, correct? You're not going to answer that? Because does Ellen White, now we, we look at Testimonies 9-11, and Ellen White talks about 9-11, right? So does she place it at the Sunday Law, or does she place it at 9-11? Revelation 18. I don't, I don't really want to answer this question for you guys. Okay, so let's go over here to the Spirit of Prophecy. Well, I thought it, I thought it started, the first angel has to derive at 9-11, and the second angel began at 9-11. I mean, ended at 9-11. Okay. Um, well, we know the first angel is empowered at 9-11. 
and the second angel arrives at 9 11 in in our history so in 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 understanding that and and we get this a number of different ways but one place that illustrates it quite well is nine testimonies so in nine testimonies uh i gotta skip this here we have a, the first section is called for the coming of the king and she's going to quote hebrews 10 verse 37 which is quoting habakkuk chapter 2 uh, verse 4 right for yet a little while he that shall come will come and will not tarry or maybe that's verse 3 um habakkuk 2 verse 3 and the just shall live by faith, which is going to follow in Hebrews 10, 38. Right? So, so Paul quotes Habakkuk 2, uh, verse 1 to 4, part of it. And then she has a chapter entitled The Last Crisis, saying we are living in the time of the end. So, of course, that's 1798, but it's also 1989, right? The fast fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is near at hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgments are already falling upon the despisers of the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war are portentous. They forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. So this is something written at this point, to people after 1989. And it's talking about the coming Sunday law. So if you were in the 1990s, you're Jeff, you're a conservative Adventist, you're going to see that the next crisis coming is the Sunday law. That's what you're going to see. That's what you're looking for. You're in the time of the end. The Sunday law is coming. And um, she describes the condition of the world. And then she talks about these lofty buildings in New York City, right? On one occasion, when in New York City, I was in the night season, called upon to behold the building, buildings rising story after story toward heaven. This is the Twin Towers. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof. They were erected to glorify their owners and builders higher and still higher. These buildings rose and in them the most costly material was used. Those to whom these buildings belonged were not asking themselves, how can we best glorify God? The Lord was not in their thoughts. Right? Um, and we know that, um, uh, that, that many people were frauded in the building of 9-11, people who owned property. Um, there was a lot of under the table sort of dealing that was done and many people uh lost uh their savings um uh everything that they had basically for 9 11 for the the buildings the twin towers to go up that were taken down in 9 11. and then she says the scene that next passed before me was the an alarm of of fire men looked at the lofty and supposed fireproof buildings and said they are perfectly safe but these buildings were consumed as if made of pitch Right. So God is this is this turning point. This is 9-11. Right. So Ellen White's talking about this. And we would have to say that this is a mighty angel coming down, as she talks about um, in. Uh, I can't remember where she says this here, where she says just that they're touched. Basically, one touch of his mighty hand. Anyway, I can't find it here, whether it's right here. Um, so it talks about last for the day of the Lord is at hand, the destruction of the almighty, um, all the different things that happen after nine 11. And so we can say that this describes nine 11, but she really is also describing the Sunday law, right? Because she's going to talk about the mark of the beast. And so we can see that nine 11 is connected to the Sunday law that's coming. Yeah, so 9-11 starts on 9-11, Testimonies 9-11. So, um, but really, in Ellen White's view, this is just the Sunday law. She's not seeing, as we ex are experiencing, 
9-11 to the Sunday law in the way that, um, that we have often taught it. That is, Ellen White doesn't separate uh, Revelation 18 in that way. She sees it as one event. And one way you could look at it is when you see something from afar off, a city that's from afar off, it's just a point on a map. But as you approach it, you are entering into a reform line connected with that waymark. And the Sunday Law waymark is this reform line. But I'm arguing or trying to suggest that this movement isn't representing the entire uh, history. So we have the arrival of the second angel's message, which we would put as 9-11. So I don't know where which slide to go to. I might just have to draw this here. Um, so 9-11, so here, here's an example. Um, this is just one of my old uh, charts. So here we have 9-11 is the empowerment of the first angel. And then we have the arrival of the second. Again, you can see I have up here, because this is before we had midnight. We just had midnight cry at this time. Um, so you can see I have 9-11 here as the empowerment of the first angel. The question is, what is the arrival of the second? And we know, of course, that's 9-11. That 9-11 serves two purposes. But these two purposes uh, can illustrate where we are in this line that is in in this line here where i have all these question marks because this was just um used as an illustration back then or thought experiment to try to figure this out we know that the sunday law is and here it says the third angel arrives but really it's going to be the empowerment in our history because the third angel arrived in 1844 up here so really you'd have to put I'm going to change this. So, so let's let's deal with this. We'll do it here instead of on the whiteboard. So if I'm going to take this here, I'm just going to keep this slide. I'm just going to duplicate this. Okay, there we got it. Duplicated. It. It's a different slide. So if I'm going to take this third angel is empowered here, and I'm going to get rid of all of this. Um, Just get rid of all this so for now. I just want these way marks here. And okay, so if I'm going to take these way marks and I'm going to put this as uh, maybe I could keep it like this. So these are the way marks up here. So we're going to have. Um, this is Millerite history. And then we're going to have this reform line starting in 1989. And this reform line is going to be over here on this line. I guess we could do it. This is going to be the fourth angel. So probably what I could do here is I'll just go. Like this. Okay, so we're going to just say the fourth angel arrives, which is the second angel. Okay, so this is going to be 9 11. Right, so if you have the first, second, and third angel arriving, and then the fourth angel arriving, which is the second angel. That means obviously you have to have the first angel, and then you're up, you're going to have the empowerment of the third angel. But we know that when the second angel arrives, it joins the third angel, which has already been in this history. So if I just take uh, I don't know what I'm doing. I want. 
So the third angel arrives and it continues, right? It's not going to stop. But that means you're going to have to have a first angel here preceding the second angel because you can't have a second without the first. And then you're going to have the third angel being empowered. And that's going to be the Sunday law. So the simple way that I would do this is I would just, I'm just going to take this number here, put it here. And then I'm going to take this symbol, whoops. Uh, and put it here. So our time is almost up here. But does this make sense to people, what I just drew here in the top right corner? Hopefully people can see that. I can zoom in. That this is our history right here. But the question is, what history is this, according to Ellen White? What is this? Is this the Sunday law? And we'd have to say yes. Yes, it's the Sunday law. Right. So Ellen White sees the Sunday law from afar off. She sees the angel of Revelation 18 coming down, joining the third angel, and it's swelling to a loud cry at the Sunday law, right? So she's going to have the Sunday law. To her, this is all one event. To us, as we experience this, this has taken, you know, 30 plus years. You know, uh, if we start from when the first angel arrives, and already, well, I guess that would be, you know, since, uh, you know, since 9-11, I guess it would be, you know, 20 plus years. But this should make sense to us. And, and that's what we have to do as we start to put judges on, on the line, is we have to really understand which line we're on. Because we know we're past 9-11. But we're definitely not to the Sunday law. And we have two more waymarks before the Sunday law called Midnight and the Midnight Cry. So we have the Sunday law proper that Ellen White calls the Sunday law. But we have waymarks that go before that. But our movement, I believe, is a zoom into 9-11 waymark. And it doesn't mean that we don't pass some of the waymarks ahead of us because they can be included in this reform line just as we did with the others. So this is this is where we're going. So I, and we're taking our time so that we can understand it thoroughly. So um, we're well over time here. A any final questions? Okay. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful. For the time that we have had together, we pray that you can bless uh, this study. Uh, again, as people watch it, we pray for Dwight that you can be with him. And we ask, Lord, that you can be with each person searching for truth. Help us to continue to study and understand your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.